Hello, my name is Mallory Jenna Robinson. Join me on A Hateful Homicide, a true crime podcast dedicated to telling the stories regarding the murders of transgender, gender non-binary, and gender diverse community members in the United States and abroad. This is A Hateful Homicide. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah. transgender woman has been shot and killed in North Baltimore, Alpha. In the U.S., trans women of color have a life expectancy of just 35 years. This happens on the daily. Another one of my friends got killed right up the street from here. These cases are true. The victims are real and their voices matter. This is A Hateful Homicide. The murder of Hundi Kader, the assassination of an activist. Friday, August 12th, 2016, Istanbul, Turkey. Warning, the following episode you're about to hear may contain audio evidence of misgendering. Listening discretion is advised. Son visage et son nom sont partout. Sur les affiches et les banderoles, en deux cadères, jeunes transsexuels retrouvés brûlés au début du mois d'août à Istanbul. Malgré l'interdiction de défiler et un dispositif policier impressionnant, ils sont des centaines à être venus crier leur colère. Parmi eux, la journaliste et militante Michelle Demichevich. La dernière fois qu'une femme a été victime d'un tel crime, nous nous sommes tous mobilisés. Et la société entière s'est aussi mobilisée. Mais quand il s'agit d'une transsexuelle, les choses changent. On analyse automatiquement l'événement en fonction des normes de morale, des structures familiales et d'hétérosexisme. Un but est homosexuel, mais n'est pas allé manifester. Déçu et résigné face à des mentalités qui ne semblent pas évoluer malgré l'espoir de changement des années 2000. À l'époque, il y avait peut-être la possibilité de changer les choses par la loi. Mais maintenant, l'État lui-même soutient les comportements homophobes. Il n'a même plus besoin de s'en prendre à nous directement. Il lui suffit de laisser faire ses groupes avec leurs armes et leurs couteaux. Ces six dernières années, plus d'une trentaine de transsexuels ont été assassinés ici en Turquie. Des députés de l'opposition ont récemment proposé de durcir la loi afin de punir plus sévèrement les auteurs de crimes motivés par l'orientation sexuelle de leurs victimes. It's Friday, August 12th, 2016, in the city of Istanbul, Turkey. It would be the home where a 23-year-old trans-Turkish female, Hundi Kader, would reside. And when her body was found badly mutilated, burned, and sexually assaulted, it would leave the city of Istanbul instigating justice for years to come. Welcome, my audience. Thank you all so much for tuning in to season four of A Hateful Homicide, the murder of Hundi Kader, the assassination of an activist. This case involves a young woman who was motivated, determined, who persevered over so many obstacles in her life. She became an iconic figure for the city of Istanbul and the country of Turkey, resisting the violence and the discrimination that herself, her community members faced, she was determined to speak up and become an activist for her community. And that she did, especially in the summer of 2015 at Istanbul Pride. My audience, we're gonna go into this case in season four. We're gonna talk about Hundi's life, her truth, a little bit about how her body was badly discovered by her flatmate. Um, also, we're going to hear from other trans community members in the city of Istanbul pertaining to their own experiences as trans folks in Istanbul, Turkey, as well as an incredible blogger and friend of mine from Florida named Delia Cordova. 
she has an incredible commentary on the hateful homicide of Hundi Kader, and you all are definitely going to want to hear this. But first, I want to go into this case, um, again, the assassination of an activist. It all began on Friday, August 12th, 2016, in the city of Istanbul. 23-year-old Hundi Kader was missing. Her roommate Davout Digiler had realized that it had been several days since Hundi Kader had been seen. However, there was a knock on his door that Friday from the police department. They wanted him to come down to the coroner's office. A body had been discovered. They thought it could be his roommate Hundi Kader. Davout had been concerned he hadn't seen or heard from his roommate in several days. The last that he had seen her was getting into the car of a client. Yes, a client, Hundi Kader, was not only an LGBTQIA activist, but she was also a proud survival sex worker. And so Davout knew when she did not return home the next day, which would have been August 10th of 2016, he knew something was wrong. But because of the discrimination and barriers that trans folks face in Istanbul, Turkey on a day-to-day -day basis, he was hesitant to report his roommate missing. However, he didn't have to report her missing. When the law enforcement knocked on his door and urged him to come down to the coroner's office, he had viewed several bodies and even a badly burned body. The coroner asked Davout again, describe Hundi's physical features. He did. And as the coroner reviewed the report in his computer, he realized that the badly burned body in the morgue was that of 23-year-old trans-Turkish activist Hundi Kader. Davout then had to, hey, to, to face the painful realization that his roommate, his soul sister that he loved, that he protected, was dead, that she had met a hateful homicide, and he wanted justice. And so as we go through this case again, Davout was determined to seek justice. He became a spokesperson for Hundi and he wanted to understand what happened. The law enforcement of Istanbul assured Davut that there would be justice that they would seek into the hateful homicide of Hundi. And Davut wanted to believe law enforcement. And in the initial investigation, my audience, it seemed like that there was some probing and prodding into the disappearance and the subsequent um, discovery of her body in the forest, um, you know, in Istanbul's, you know, kind of lower east side. And what's heartbreaking and heart aching is that, again, not only was her body badly burned, which was to cover up the DNA evidence, but then also she was sexually assaulted. Yes, my audience, that horrific word, rape. And she also had been mutilated, met with sharp force trauma throughout her entire body. This left her roommate, as well as her other close friends and loved ones, seeking justice for the next six years. And as we continue to go through this case, we're gonna get an understanding that Hundi was not the only person in Turkey, especially the city of Istanbul, that faced discrimination and heartache. Out of all of the countries in the continent of Europe, Turkey has the highest rate of trans violence towards their community members. And so Hundi Kader, in the summer of 2015, it was their pride season, the trans community was determined to be very visible that summer, more so than usual. And when they showed up and was there themselves, for themselves, celebrating with the L and the G and the B and the QIA, they were met with so much resistance, so much violence, there they had things such as water bullets, um, pepper spray, water cannons, water hoses, all placed upon their bodies to get them out of that event. And that is what you heard in the beginning of the episode, my audience. It was those protesters 
advocating against the discrimination that the transgender, gender non-binary, non-conforming, intersex and two-spirit community members go through on a day-to-day -day basis in the city of Istanbul. And so again, Hundi was there that summer, June 25th of 2015. And she was one of those people who was in the front that was getting holes, that she was also, um, you know, getting things thrown at her. There are images online, my audience, that you can just simply type in her name and you can see these very, you know, bloody, battered images of Hundi from the, the violence that she faced that summer of 2015. But despite that, you know, she never let that deter her. She still continued to live her best life for another year and so before her hateful homicide that August of 2016. But despite the violence and in spite of the violence that she went through that summer of 2015, she picked herself back up and she continued to advocate for her community. The reality in Istanbul, especially for the trans community, my audience, is that there is no form of gainful employment for the trans community. So often what has happened is that the trans community, even here in the United States, as a activist myself, an advocate, which that was one of the, the pieces that resonated with this case um, more so than um, others, was the fact that you had this incredible woman who was just determined to not let what happened in her life um, keep her down. And she was so kind and giving to others. And her roommate, Davout Dingler, you know, speaks fondly of his roommate and speaking fondly of the, the experiences that they had, you know, not only at Pride, but then also just, you know, having good times listening to Celine Dion or watching an episode of the Oprah Winfrey show or, you know, just going to a bar and just being young and free. And in the summer of 2016, in August of 2016, Hundi Kadera was 23 years old and she had so many things going for herself my audience you know she was looking forward to putting herself in school she wanted to make her activist career broader and bigger and bolder so even on a global level she had already based on the experience that she faced in the summer of 2015 had reached millions just in Turkey alone and was wanting to take her platform even broader and unfortunately that was all snuffed out around August 12th of 2016 when her body was discovered badly mutilated, burned, and sexually assaulted in a forest in the city of Istanbul, Turkey. However, as we know, the trans community, as myself, I identify as an Afro-Caribbean trans woman that we know far too often that the violence that our community faces is real and it's very prevalent. And Hundi's case is not the only case of violence and discrimination. And so what I wanna do now is just have you all just take a moment and hear some of the stories and voices from other victims, survivors, and thrivers in Istanbul, people of the trans experience, the gender non-conforming and inner sex experience who want to make sure that what happened to Hundi does not go in vain. Ressentez un immense apaisement, quoi, c'est fait, et vous retournez en France ou vous devenez Olivia. Je bien dire que pas de changement de sexe, pas de changement de papier. Et là, vous devenez vraiment Olivia. Je ne suis pas devenue Olivia comme ça, sur le plan de l'état civil, euh, tout de suite, parce que euh, il faut faire une demande, c'est très compliqué, et c'est là que, dans les critères qui sont imposés pour changer d'identité, on vous oblige à avoir eu l'opération. Et ça, ouais. c'est quelque chose qu'il faut bien comprendre, que euh, justement, les personnes dont je parlais tout à l'heure qui ne désirent pas être opérées, on va les obliger quand même à être opérées. Et quand il s'agit d'une femme qui devient un homme, l'opération est quasiment impossible. Hein. Eikai is a mother figure, a leader in Turkey's LGBT community. Annenizden ayrız bir anneler gibi de herkesin ağladığını bilirim. Aile konusu çok farklı. Onun için bir annelik kelimesi yakıştırdılar. She slept on the streets, worked as a prostitute, a housekeeper, but she's trained as a teacher. Job opportunities are limited for someone who is visibly different. You'll notice she covers her hair. It was an act of faith and survival, she says, 
after moving to a more conservative neighborhood. Aslında orada transfer'ımı kabul etmek çok zordu, zor bir süreçti. Kendim bulunduğum topluma uyma gibi bir e, psikolojim vardı benim. Onlar çağırmaya başladılar. Hani e, zararsız bir insan olduğumu görmüşlerdi. Çünkü Türkiye'de translar şey olarak lanse ediliyor. Öcü. Yani, Hayır hepimiz insanız ya. Yani bunu görmemek için e, e, insanlar çabalıyor sanki. Öyle dudak Many Turks seem to have selective vision. This is Zeki Müren, one of the most famous, beloved performers in Turkish history. He was awarded Turkey's version of the Order of Canada. A gay icon, though he never spoke publicly about his sexuality. His funeral in 1996 drew thousands. He was revered by even some of the most conservative people in this country. Bülent Ersoy is known as the diva, a big star whose peak was in the 70s and 80s, but she's still pumping out hits and making headlines. She transitioned from male to female before anyone even knew to use the word transgender. Their fame is a hypocrisy that some find hard to accept. Türk toplumunda şu an sahnedekileri alkışlıyoruz, sokaktakilerini taşlıyoruz. Yani böyle bir mantık var. It is a double standard. And there's resentment these stars didn't do more to further the LGBT cause. That in 2015, they're still facing hatred and the violent crimes that come with it. This victim was stabbed several times by two clients this spring. Well-known trans activist and sex worker Kemal Erdek was robbed and raped in early July. <laughs> Aiden Johnson recorded this video in January. She said she couldn't live life the way she wanted to. Not long after, she took her own life. She was 24. Attacks and deaths are a constant for this community. Eğer bir hareket büyüyorsa, destekçisi olduğu gibi nefret edeni saldıranı da çok olur. Asya Dilaman is also a trans activist. Artık kızlarımız gelsin! hosting Miss Trans Turkey. These women want to be seen, accepted. There's a trans fashion show too, another way to help the community survive. It raised more than $10,000 last year, money that's a lifeline for people who no one else will help. It funded an LGBT shelter, Turkey's first, that houses up to 20 people. Seda says she wouldn't be alive if this place didn't exist. She was beaten on the street. As dire as it still is for some, others see signs of progress. The fight the trans community in Turkey is in right now is one that gays here have started to win. Many tell me that there's a newfound freedom now. They're also starting to feel comfortable being open about their sexuality, at least in cities such as Istanbul. Being gay or trans is not illegal in Turkey. Still, after years of peaceful pride celebrations, Turkish authorities pounced on people at this year's parade in Istanbul. It happened to coincide with Ramadan, the holiest month in Islam. Proof that acceptance, tolerance, is always tenuous here. Turkey's political situation is why Nilar Albayrak got involved in politics. She was a nominee for MP candidacy last year, and she wasn't the only LGBT candidate. And many now say sex work does not have to be the only option. Aylin Pinar Ertaş is also breaking the mold. She transitioned two years ago and is now a doctor. It may not be a smooth transition in Turkey. These ladies bear the scars that prove that. 
but the country's colors are slowly changing. These steps weren't meant to be an LGBT symbol, but they've become one. The LGBT presence is pushing Turks towards a new era of acceptance, so that pride, in all its colors, can be set in stone too. Bilkex on CBC News, Istanbul. And as you can hear my audience, these community members in the city of Istanbul, Turkey, have been victims of violence in the form of being beaten, sexually assaulted, and they are surviving and thriving. And some of them have become doctors and activists themselves and take the, the case of Hundi Kader and use that as a driving force, as a catalyst to be the agents of change that they want to see for the community there. And what is really, you know, empowering for me hearing their stories is the fact that they never give up. That despite and in spite of the fact that yes, it is not illegal to be trans or queer in Turkey, but regardless of that, the violence, the discrimination, the fear that is within them is real. And despite that, they still continue to be themselves daily. You heard things like there's a trans pageant in Turkey and the funding goes to this incredible housing that has now been um, developed and, and, and is in place in Istanbul for the community to have. And one of the community members in this in this audio, you know, really talked about the fact that this home, this this home for the trans community became a safe space for her and that how she had been a victim of, you know, viciously a physical fist assault on the streets of Istanbul just weeks before the home was finished and how she had been hospitalized and then was able to, you know, get admitted into this housing and how it came in at the right time. And so all of that, despite, you know, the fact that she was violently beaten, she has still now used her platform to continue to help others, um, those who are also victims of violence. I wanted to go also back into the when Davut Dingler, the roommate of Hundi Kader, the 23-year-old trans Turkish female who met the hateful homicide on August 12th of 2016, that Friday when her body was discovered um, in the woods. Her roommate, Devu Dinglair, according to BBC.com, describes in quote, I was about to leave the morgue. I felt a sense of lightness for not having found her there. At the last minute, a doctor there said, there's also a burned body. Look at that as well. I did. I told them identifying features. They then looked at the computer, at the report. The doctor put his hand on my back and gave his condolences. I lost myself. He also, Davut Dingler, <clears throat> also went into talking about his um, his reaction to Hundi Kinder's, um response to the violence that other community members face, especially those who were met with um, hateful homicides. He quoted, she would go crazy when trans individuals were killed. She'd be so sad she had been stabbed and beaten before. This didn't only happen to Hundi, it happens to all of them. And again, you heard this in the audio evidence as well. Beaten, sexually assaulted, mutilated, burned. I mean, the violence and the daily hatred is real. And again, our community members in the city of Istanbul continuously needs your support. And so we wanna make sure that we continue not only to support our community members in Turkey, but then also make sure that we say the name of Hundi Kader, that incredible, beautiful 23-year-old trans Turkish female who met a hateful homicide for simply being herself and for simply doing what a lot of the community members in Istanbul, Turkey, and also just within the world do, which is survival sex work. So many times our community members is met with this backlash, right? Especially when it comes to our sex workers. Oh, they must have done something. This must have, you know, been the cause. And we know far too often that the clients, the cisgendered men, and remember our cisgender terminology is someone who's assigned to male at birth and continues to identify as male even now. 
And so that's their internal truth. And so again, you have these cisgender men who are discreet and down low. And again, knew that Hundi Kader was beloved and adored by millions, not only in Istanbul, but also throughout Turkey. And knew the fact that she was an iconic figure for change and she was speaking up and speaking out. And in 2016, she was getting ready to have policies and legislations brought into the, the, the city's government to see how things could be improved for the community. And so there's been these conspiracy theories, right? Like, was it a setup? Was this client a murder for hire to assure that Hundi calls for justice, right? Her, her fight for justice, especially for our community, our trans community. Was it a way to get her out there and then silence her for good in the most horrific way? That is the question, my audience. And I want you all to take a, you know, my Apple podcast listeners, my Spotify listeners, my, on my other podcast platform listeners, I also want you to ask, answer this question to you. Um, and you'll see it in the Q&A portion. Do you consider yourself to be an activist? And if so, what has been the cause that you have felt yourself wanting to advocate for and then also activate a change for? Like Hundi, her primary mission was to assure that that the trans community, especially those of the sex work experience, um, was not met with violence, was not met with being detained for simply trying to survive and knowing that this was the only form of employment that the community gets. So she was really prevalent in wanting to assure that the community received legal, <clears throat> legal justifications and legal um, you know, rights to assure that if you are a survival sex worker, that you wouldn't be detained, that you wouldn't be imprisoned. If you, let's say, had um, over five to six condoms in your purse or handbag, that this would not result in you being assumed as sex worker and then therefore also penalized. So all of these things, Hundi Kader was working on with some of these other community members that you heard in the audio evidence. And so again, each and every one of them was very impacted by the August 12, 2016 hateful homicide of Hundi Kader and spoke about it again, as you could hear, but then also speaking about their own experiences and how they were fortunate to survive that type of violence. And Hundi, as you heard her, her flatmate, David Dingler, uh, mentioned that she had too been stabbed and beaten before. And also, again, in the summer of 2015 at Istanbul's Pride, that June 25th of 2015, where she was met with a barrage of water cannons, bullets, pepper spray, things thrown at her, she continued to be determined and she was resilient. And that is how we want to continue to remember her six years later. And that's how the residents of Istanbul and that's how the community of Turkey, all of those trans community members and even cis community members too, those allies and accomplices who were really impacted by her her legacy for wanting to assure that the community would not be so victimized and isolated and siloed continuously like we have been for decades and so again when I think of myself as someone who identifies as an activist and an advocate for the trans community for the gender nonconforming and intersex community it's heart aching personally to know that someone who was in the prime of her life you know in 2016 who was still continuously persevering despite the vicious violence she faced the threats the attacks um, not only from community members but law enforcement and all of that propelled her to continuously seek justice for the community in Istanbul. And to know that all she was trying to do was work and survive like so many of us do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then all of a sudden her life is just snuffed out in the most vicious way. It leaves a sense of sadness and ache uh, within you. But it also leaves a message of hope and motivation that Hundi Kader, who was also aware of the violence and would also be sad and, and heart ached for other members, um, as her roommate said, that she too would be heart ached and heartbroken for community members who had also met violence and death before her. We feel that for her too, but we also, like she did for those, um, she continued to press on and that's what we will do as a community. Not only those, we wanna acknowledge our community 
community in Istanbul, Turkey and, and within the country of Turkey itself and in the continent of Europe, but also here in the United States, even here in Los Angeles, California. So many times our community members are facing discrimination from employment to transportation, housing, and especially access to just resources in general. And so I now want to give you a moment to hear from my soul sister. I've known her, oh my goodness, since 2014. Um, and so her incredible um, blog on YouTube, her name is Delia Cordova. She's an incredible trans activist herself out in Florida. And um, I just adore her dearly. And she um, provides an incredible commentary on the hateful homicide of Hundi Kader. Hey Daily Boppers! So for anyone who isn't already aware, a very outspoken trans rights activist and sex workers rights activist named Hande Kader was found raped and burned to death on August 12th in Istanbul, Turkey. She was a huge voice in helping to bring awareness to the violence sex workers and queer people face in a nation where homosexuality and transness aren't considered illegal, but the levels of discrimination and violence against women and queer people is still overwhelming. It's always tragic and frightening when one of our sisters is murdered, but for me, on a personal level, this case is particularly frightening. Because when all the news outlets refer to her specifically as a trans rights activist and as a loud voice in her area, I have to look in the mirror and remember that I'm not exactly low-key myself. Obviously, I don't live in Turkey, but even in the United States, 18 trans women have been murdered so far just this year. And I'm also not a full-service sex worker, but neither are many of the other trans women of color who are murdered right here at home, so that doesn't really set me much more at ease either. I feel like there probably are those who would say that it's selfish of me to feel that way as an American, but to imply that we actually treat queer people with human dignity even here at home would be honestly bordering on delusional. If that was true, we wouldn't see the number of trans murder victims and suicides that we see each year. Pulse wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have politicians running for office threatening to overturn marriage equality and divert money from AIDS research to fund the anti-queer conversion therapy. There wouldn't be a debate over trans people's right to use the restroom in safety, and I could go on. I do have privilege for being an American. I have no idea what it's like to be an outspoken trans sex worker in Turkey, but I'm still a queer trans woman of color, and much like Hande, I don't back down. And I don't particularly like to think about it, but I know I have friends and fans who think of me immediately the second something like this happens, because I'm one of those people who is probably just loud enough to get myself into trouble one day. But really, this could happen to any of us. Knowing that creates a legitimate anxiety, which is really something that I feel like all transgender women, especially transgender women of color, have every right to feel given the circumstances. But the question is, what do we do with it? Because while Hande's story is thankfully actually getting at least some degree of international media coverage, trans women are killed here at home all the time, and most cisgender Americans just never even hear about it. But we do. And I feel like sometimes we can find ourselves exhausted and overwhelmed, almost to the point of numbness, and we just don't even want to look at it or think about it anymore. And that's okay. Life has to go on. That's what we have Transgender Day of Remembrance for. But even that's really still not fair, and it's definitely not easy. Every time I see another one of my sisters dead, I know I just want to break down and cry all day. But the world doesn't stop for trans women to mourn our dead and reassure ourselves. If it did, it would have to stop with alarming frequency, and unfortunately, that just can't happen. The world can't stop spinning, and neither can any of us. And nor should we, because we deserve better than what the world is willing to offer us right now. Hande deserve better, all of our dead sisters deserve better, and you deserve better. Every single one of us deserves a happy, long, fulfilling life just as much as any cisgender person does. We're probably not going to actually get that for a very long time, but we do deserve it. So I want you to know that it's okay to mourn and feel frightened, but it's also okay to live your life, and not just to fight the patriarchy, but also for yourself and your own happiness. Because the fact of the matter is that we don't really have the luxury of time to give every single one of the lives we lose the proper warning they deserve when it happens. But we can remember every single one of them and do our best to honor them by spreading awareness of their lives and the beautiful people they were and everything they accomplished and by choosing to live our lives just as proudly and openly and with just as much zeal for life and defiance in the face of oppression as they did and choosing not to let fear overwhelm us but instead 
to motivate us so that if our names ever do become the next hashtag, we can at least rest in the knowledge that we burned as brightly as we could, made the biggest difference we could, and led the most fulfilling and meaningful lives we could before we had to go. It's why I do everything I do and why I'll always continue to do everything I do because for me, it's the only way I can keep going and deal with all the stress and anxiety that I naturally feel having to know that any of our ends could come that way. It's okay to feel fear, but I feel like the best thing we can do with that fear is to learn to let it empower us, to live the brightest, bravest, and most defiant lives we can, and to touch as many other lives as possible, even if that just means making a difference for one other person. Because we're all here for a reason, and future generations of people like us deserve a better world than the one we live in today. And we can make that happen, but only if we actually live our lives to the fullest and refuse to back down like Hande Kader did. And our safety is still never a currency to be exchanged for progress, and it's still absolutely okay to do everything everything you need to in order to ensure your own safety, but we can still do that without letting the fear and sadness of events like these rule our lives and hold us back from doing everything we're capable of and everything we deserve. And I know the world doesn't want us to feel this way, but each and every one of us deserves the world. And I just want you to remember that includes you, no matter what. So burn as brightly as you can, because Hande Kader was a star, and so are all the rest of us. As always, thank you so very much for watching, and until next time, be yourself. Again, my sister Delia Melodia Cordova, please check out her YouTube, and I mean, it's so impactful. And she said it perfectly, continue to be yourselves because we do not know how long we have on this earth. And Hundi Kader shined brightly. And I wanna take a moment now and talk a little bit more about her life. Born January 5th, 1993 in Istanbul, Turkey, to Hans and Arsuna Kader. She came from a family of siblings and grandparents and aunts and uncles. However, when Hundi Kader, at the age of 14, identified openly as a binary trans woman, her family was not supportive. This left her living on the streets in Istanbul and living literally couch surfing um, from friends and family members who were accepting and intolerant. But then of course, due to, as you heard Delia mention, the patriarchy and discrimination just for even supporting trans community members. And we know this far too often now, even in this modern day with the trans bans that are going on from teachers being penalized for supporting trans students, for disclosing their identities to so many other ways. And so this is exactly what was happening in Istanbul. So unfortunately, Hundi Kader, by the age of 16, was subsequently unhoused and living on the streets. This then turned her to um, survival sex work. This would have been around circa 2010. And she continuously um, lived um, her life as a survival sex worker. She found herself loving to sing. She would do karaoke with her friends. And one of those friends that she picked up along the way around the summer of 2011 was then 24-year-old Davout Dingler, a cisgendered man heterosexual, but nonetheless seemed to really resonate and connect with Hundi Kader. The two had this kindred spirit, had known each other um, on and off, had kind of met in passing, but really started to really establish that friendship, that deepened bond around that summer of 2011. And Davout Dingler, you know, one of the things that he shares, he doesn't speak to publicly um, on audio, but one of the things that he does in his um, recorded interviews, um, those those ones that are notated, um, those press interviews, he talks a lot around Hundi's resilience and her determination to overcome the obstacles that she had been through from being unhoused by the age of 14 um, to being completely without any resources at the age of 16. At the time of her, her hateful homicide in 2016, Hundi Kader had be, um, not only been in her social transition for about six years, but also she had begun a medical journey too. She was in the process um, with money that she 
had been saving for years and doing survival sex work to obtain her gender affirming surgery. And those were one of the things that she was looking forward to and connecting with medical providers in Istanbul. Remember, it's not illegal to identify as trans or openly queer or gay in Istanbul. And so there are some medical providers who don't work with insurances, but will also allow the community to receive gender affirming surgeries for the right cost. And so Hundi Kadera was one of those community members who wanted to pursue a post-operative, right? Post-operative being someone who um, goes from being pre-operative, someone who has um, who was had their um, anatomy, their frontal assigned at birth, and then had that, um, th- that affirmed through surgical means. Uh, and becoming post-operative and that is um, Hundi's goal that was her goal um, in 2016 it's interesting because one of the things that when I think of that that year itself 2016 you know when we think of that her journey of wanting to become post-op and I remember myself that same year undergoing my own gender affirming surgery and I think to myself you know when I was you know researching this case and really you know, connecting with Hundy's story and her case, I thought to myself, like, wow, you know, like, she was so close. You know what I mean? Like, she had, like, she was so close. She had that money. And and she was so ready to get her gender-affirming surgery in my audience when, you know, again, she was just doing her, her usual that she had been doing for over six years, survival sex work. And unfortunately, that... One August, that one summer night, she just did not return home. And again, her roommate, Davout Dingler, knew in his gut that when she did not return by August 10th of 2016, that subsequently that he was either going to have to report her missing or her body was going to be discovered, which it was that Friday of August 12th of 2016 in the forest of the city of Istanbul, Turkey. One of the things I wanted to also discuss um, is this month, this November, and November is Trans Awareness Month. Also, specifically November 13th through the 20th is Trans Awareness Week. We know with the case um, um, back in season three, uh, where we talked about the incredible Trans Day of Remembrance. And so again, for our Trans Awareness Week in particular, which kickstarts today, November 13th. So again, I wanted to kickstart season four on Trans Awareness Week in particular. And one of the things I want us to make sure that we understand is that our victims, our community members, members of the TGI experience deserves better than what we've received. And unfortunately, even now in the present day of 2022, our community members are consistently still facing bans here in the United States, but then even abroad, like countries such as Turkey, even cities such as Istanbul. And when our community members there are continuously being beaten, sexually assaulted, sharp force trauma throughout their bodies, burned you name it these horrific things and we know this even in season three finale with the hateful homicide of Dwayne Jones in Jamaica that this is real and until we continuously understand that our community members of the trans experience are simply just trying to be ourselves for ourselves without the retributions of violence, without the physical threats, without the verbal harassment. As you heard from other members, there were several trans members who were so depressed and tired of being beaten and traumatized daily that they took their own lives. And this is the reality that we have to remember that the reality of our community members facing violence and discrimination is real. So we must do our parts to assure that we are going to make sure that our community members no longer face this. And so you can do your part, my audience, as activists and advocates, just like Hundi Kader did. She continuously persevered and was resilient for justice, for change, and for advocacy for community members. And you all can do the same too. Do not let Hundi Kader's death, her hateful homicide, go in vain. Her perpetrator has not been captured. And we know this far too well again, referencing the season three finale, the hateful homicide of Dwayne Jones, Goodbye Gully Queen where their perpetrator has still remained at large. 
And this is the same for an iconic figure like Hundi Kader, this beautiful 23 year old trans Turkish female who was simply trying to live her life, not only for ad advocating and advocating for the others in Istanbul, but also for herself, right? For her own medical journey, for her own self respect. And then to know that by simply doing what she had been doing for years, the only type of resource that she could, that she could do, right? Which is survival sex work, like so many of our community members not just in turkey but even here as you heard delia mentioned we have to do and the reality is is that our trans women of color are facing discrimination and violence at a high propensity especially since 2013 where it has now become documented thanks to the human rights campaign so as we prepare to conclude this case, I want you all to remember this week here, November 13th through the 20th, as Trans Awareness Week. And I want to remember our beloved trans-Turkish beautiful sister, Hundi Kader, born January 5th, 1993, and resting on since August 12th of 2016. We remember you yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever and always thank you all so much my audience for tuning in to season four premiere of a hateful homicide the murder of hundi kader the assassination of an activist my name is mallory jenner robinson your host thank you all so much for tuning in please tune in um, i will pick up regularly on saturdays at 12 p.m pacific standard time but in honor of trans awareness week kick starting today this sunday i wanted to kick start season four on trans awareness week in particular but again stay tuned for season Season 4, Episode 2, next Saturday, 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Again, please check out our website. It has been updated with our Season 3 episodes. Um, thanks to our incredible um, videographer, website developer, Jack Jamila Brew. Please, please definitely follow, support him. A huge thank you to the production team who continuously work with me, Sebastian, Kitty, James, you all, I appreciate you all so much. And again, just to you, my audience, for your continuously love and support and sharing and making sure that our victims continuously have a voice. So again, please enjoy the rest of your Sunday and I look forward to connecting with you all next Saturday at 12 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Please feel free to follow A Hateful Homicide on Instagram at A Hateful Homicide. And you can follow me at MalloryJenna90. Thank you so much. And again, have a great day. Bye-bye.